Welcome everybody to the uh, 2020 Alaka Alliance Virtual Symposium. We had originally hoped to do this in person, but as we all know, uh, circumstances changed, so here we are. And in some ways, it uh, expanded the reach of our symposium from those who could physically travel to uh, attend to people across the world and across the country who can sit in the comfort of their office or their living room or out on the deck or driving around in their fishing boat, whatever. So welcome to Sea Otters and Oregon's Kelp Ecosystem. We have three speakers this afternoon. I want to uh, thank you all for your attending and taking the time to do that. Um, and also to those of you who donated when you registered, this was not an insignificant thing and it's really helped us to provide the technology here to make this thing possible. So thanks again and if you, uh, for those of you who did not and you find this worthwhile, maybe after it's over you can go to our website and make an, an additional donation. Shameless plug here. So also your registration name and email will be added to our list to receive our monthly newsletter. If you don't want to uh, have that happen, then you can hit unsubscribe when it's all over. Uh, and we will be sending you a follow-up email with a questionnaire. We want to find out a little bit more about your experience here, who you are, why you're here, and, and so on. But it won't be very long. I hate long questionnaires that re require a bunch of time, so we'll try to keep it simple. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Hatfield Marine Science Center and the Oregon Chapter of the Wildlife Society for helping us get the word out. It's been really great to have these two uh, institutions, entities as our partner in this. And I also want to thank the Meyer Memorial Trust for the funding support that has made this possible too. So uh, th thanks to the sponsors and uh, supporters. So, so for those of you that don't know about the Alaka Alliance, I want to say that we are an Oregon nonprofit seeking to improve the diversity, resilience, and productivity of the nearshore and estuarine ecosystems by restoring sea otters to Oregon. And in so doing, we're committed to a, using sound science as a basis for restoring otters to Oregon. We want to understand and avoid or minimize the impacts on other ocean users. We recognize this isn't 1856 anymore, it's uh, 2020, 21 and uh, things have changed in the ocean. So we want to avoid or minimize those impacts. And we want to learn from lessons offered elsewhere about the effects of sea otters on the ecosystem and coastal communities. So you can check out a lot more about us, a lot of learning resources, a lot of our activities uh, at www.alakaalliance.org or just Google alakaalliance.org. So today, uh, we're asking that everybody keep yourselves muted during the presentations. And if you have questions for the uh, presenter that will, uh, for the Q&A afterwards, please send those in the chat room uh, to John Goodell. And he's gonna keep track of those as best he can and, tr and try to group similar questions uh, into uh, one question at the end. And because there are so many of us, we may not have time for all questions, but we'll do our best. We will end this session at the 55 minute mark, and that will give us a five minute break before the next session, which today will be uh, Sarah. <clears throat> so with that, I wanna introduce our first speaker, Scott Groth, uh, by saying that any decision to restore a species, sea otter or not, to its former habitat, must consider the state of the habitat into which it is to be introduced. So the Alaka Alliance will rely on the experience of people such as Scott was a shellfish scientist for the Marine Resources Program in the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife in Charleston, Oregon. Scott grew up in upstate New York, worked on water quality issues in Lake Ontario, has hiked the Appalachian Trail, which is quite an accomplishment, worked with fishermen as a biologist in the Bering Sea in Alaska, and worked as a hydrographic surveyor for the Army Corps of Engineers in Norfolk, Virginia. He has been with ODFNW since 1999 and has been in his current position since 2004. He manages Oregon's pink shrimp fishery, which is the first shrimp fishery certified sustainable, and as well as the sea urchin and abalone fisheries. <clears throat> he oversees monitoring, research, and management decisions for these fisheries, and is responsible for field surveys of these resources. He is a guide for mountain biking events, plays hockey, and most importantly, 
uh, is the father of twin 16-year-old daughters. Good luck, Scott. Scott has an extensive understanding of the conditions of Oregon's nearshore marine environment with regard to urchin barrens, kelp forests, and the marine communities within them. He has shared much of this in a podcast that you can find on the Alaka Alliance website. Because he has firsthand knowledge of this environment into which sea otters might someday return, we are pleased to have him share his understanding with us. So Scott, hit screen share, it's all yours. Okay, okay, got it. Does that look like my screen? Yeah, it looks like your screen. All right, perfect. Thank you, sir. Thanks for that introduction, Bob. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm gonna overlap a little bit of what you said uh, with a little, just a little background of my own here. Uh, so like you said, I, I work for ODFW. My primary role is managing the pink shrimp fishery, which is the state's second largest fishery. It's a big industrial fishery. And then I have, you know, kind of all these uh, smaller fisheries uh, which include abalones, where we had a, a brief commercial flat abalone fishery. Uh, you know, we have two species, flat and red, basically, in Oregon. So we had a brief commercial flat abalone fishery that I managed and closed in 2008. And then we had this persistent red abalone recreational fishery, which is currently suspended. But it had a pretty good run uh, since the early 50s. Uh, I also manage a couple other smaller fisheries, including spot prawns, which is our uh, biggest shrimp on the coast, but a small fishery, and uh, rock scallops, which have a lot of overlap with these species. Uh, they are probably the most delicious thing you can find in the ocean, uh, but it's very hard to obtain. They're uh, only caught by recreational divers, so we manage that as a recreational fishery. And then lastly, uh, the fisheries for sea urchins so we have two sea urchins that I'll kind of talk about today. Uh, the purple sea urchin on the left, and then a red sea urchin on the right. Uh, and those fisheries have been robust in the past and, and uh, have changed over time and then changed again. So we'll just look through that. Uh, so I just want to give a comparison of, you know, as a fishery manager, how to deal with these fisheries. Uh, pink shrimp is a this gigantic fishery along the whole west coast that employs hundreds of people, uh, brings in about $25 million to Oregon each year. That's like at the dock, so that can get expanded out. But that species only lives one to three years. Uh, so it's really tricky to manage. Uh, we don't use a quota on that fishery, but instead we do intensive, uh, intensive fishery monitoring to understand and back calculate uh, the stocks to assure the overfishing doesn't occur and we can react to it should it. Uh, like, like you said, Bob, uh, Oregon's pink shrimp fishery was the first shrimp fishery in the world to be certified sustainable. And that's thanks to a lot of hard work by my predecessors in industry in trying to assure the sustainability of the stock, reduce bycatch, it's a super low bycatch shrimp fishery, uh, you know, we get like two to four percent bycatch and uh, to monitor that uh, habitats are not strongly affected by that fishery. And when I compare that to the red sea urchin fishery, this is an artisanal fishery where there's a few people that do it and they tend to work in this fishery lifelong and year round. Uh, it's a real, uh, real skill sets required. So we only have a few participants in any year uh, in, in that fishery and it brings in, you know, just enough money basically for those people to be employed uh, year round. Unlike uh, pink shrimp, uh, which live, you know, one to three years in that fishery, red sea urchins can live a hundred years or more. So it's quite a difference in managing those stocks. Uh, but another similarity, and it's not uncommon for invertebrate uh, invertebrate fisheries is we don't use a quota for that fishery either. So now we'll go all the way back to what is a sea urchin and the first thing I'll tell you is that's what it's not. It's not an urchin. Uh, an urchin is I think translates from Greek as something like spiny skinned or 
hedgehog or something and then it got adapted into you know hoodlums in the UK being called urchins uh, and resulting in this the predecessor band to Iron Maiden was named urchin so we're not talking about those guys today but we will talk about sea urchins and those are echinoderms uh, they are closely related to sea stars sand dollars and sea cucumbers they have that you know pentamerous symmetry where they're five-sided animal uh, and they're an important component of marine ecosystems around the world here in oregon uh, and pertinent to this talk uh, i'll talk about two sea urchins so first we have the red and those are red ish they come in white and purple and and red but uh they're called red but may not always be red they have long spines they're very big they're one of the biggest sea urchins in the world and they live comparatively deep to purples and this species is 99 percent of oregon's and really the west coast sea urchin fishery so compare that to purple sea urchins which are again purple-ish they also come in white green and pink uh, those have shorter spines are smaller are shallower they're probably the species you're familiar with seeing in tide pools and they really have a low market value uh, and that's uh, probably a result of their small size and their relatively difficult uh, time accessing they're so shallow so just to put those two in a picture together uh, these two big guys here are red sea urchins you know there's a big red one here and a big purple red sea urchin here and this is a purple sea urchin so that's a good size comparison uh, for what it's worth that's a sea cucumber back there and a, a urtichina anemone and some kelp uh, so the structure of this is to talk about sea urchins biology their fisheries and trends in their populations so we'll jump into biology first uh, so sea urchins uh, particularly red and purples that we're talking about here live in shallow vegetated rocky reefs they basically occupy the entire kelp footprint uh, as that's what they eat sea urchins uh, reproduce by broadcast spawning that's male and female they have separate sexes uh, simultaneously emit gametes into the water column which is what this uh, red sea urchin is doing here and if those those male and female gametes meet you get the result is this fertilized trochophore larvae called pluteus uh, so that system we'll go back one that system of you know trying to throw your gametes in the in the water and, and hope for the best does not work very well so so the way they've adapted to that is by having very long lives you know they get a lot of chances of reproduction so red sea urchins are known to live uh, a maximum of beyond 100 years uh, a gentleman in the in the lower right is uh, dr tom ebert who is a, a great guy spent his whole life studying sea urchins uh, he's currently faculty at osu uh, and the sea urchin he's holding is something we work together on uh, to get like th the biggest sea urchin we could because he's going to get that aged by using uh, radiocarbon techniques see if how old the biggest one could be so a little more on reproduction here this is a little animation that I think I like to really elucidate the, the fact of how uh, recruitment in sea urchins really affects their populations so if you have one sea urchin you know everybody knows that's not going to work right and if you have two sea urchins and they're distant uh, that is also not going to work these these two sea urchins have to be in close proximity uh, that's called density dependent spawning uh, related to the ali effect if you're familiar so that's going to result in a failure of recruitment if you have a lot of sea urchins in one place and they uh, simultaneously emit gametes uh, and those that might fertilize successfully turn into these pluteus larvae these guys uh, 
end up in the water for six to eight weeks, just being swept uh, by ocean currents. You know, there's some larval behavior involved, but by and large, those are just getting thrown around the ocean. Uh, so in Oregon, the chances of them landing in sand, which does them no good, is very high. So that is going to result in failure. You know, if all these larvae hit the sand, they're not going to survive. So, you know, this is the one in a million shot where you have uh, everything works on the left side of this diagram and then they land on a rocky reef. Uh, you have, you know, you hit the lottery. That's called, uh, you know, another way that that's often termed as sweepstakes reproduction. That is, you try a lot and fail a lot, but when you hit, you really hit big. And, and that's, that's episodic recruitment, uh, meaning they don't recruit annually, they recruit in these big episodes. So the role of sea urchins in, in Oregon's near shore is that they're grazers. Uh, you know, they clean up the bottom and that can be good or bad as, as we're seeing. And they're important habitat, uh, you know, with their large size and their big spine canopy, they're good protection for juvenile fish, juvenile sea urchins and juvenile abalones. And uh, as we see, they are ecosystem engineers. They really can change the nature of, of an environment. In terms of biological interactions, you know, we have this classic diagram depicting the, the role of each in uh, Southern California kelp beds where, where sea otters eat the urchins uh, who are fed by the kelp. And uh, I think they just have the words there. So some of the things that are kind of missing from this picture is sea otters only eat large urchins. Uh, and sea stars are the primary predator for small urchins. And uh, lastly, and this is where, uh, you know, sea otters uh, and fisheries sort of conflict is is sea otters tend to eat only fecund sea urchins, the ones that are uh, valuable to the fishery, which are feeding on kelp. And then uh, into the fishery, uh, this is the product, the fishery product for sea urchins. This is called uni, U-N-I. Uh, you see it at sushi joints everywhere. Uh, kind of wrap it in rice. It's kind of a salty, gelatinous deal. It's, it's the... Uh, sea urchins gonads. So the more they eat, the more full their gonads become. And, uh, you know, the, the more fishery product that comes out of that, I guess. It is a dive fishery. Uh, in commercial fishermen pick sea urchins up one by one uh, with a small rake uh, and there's no bycatch. It focuses in Oregon on the Southern Oregon coast. Uh, like I've been saying with sea urchins and their overlap with kelp beds, 90% uh, of our kelp beds are south of Charleston, so that's about the same percentage of our sea urchin harvest that's south of Charleston. And then this is just another look at uni. You know, if you crack open a, a, a big red sea urchin like this is, uh, it's just full of gonads. Uh, the fishery product is actually, you know, I talked about the five-sided symmetry earlier. You get five of these uh, skeins, which is sometimes called rho, but it's not truly rho since it's uh, male or female. Uh, so you get five of these guys out of each, each sea urchin. And I have, you know, in my course of work, uh, eaten quite a bit of this. And the only thing I can tell is when it's bad. And I can tell you, if you put that in your mouth, you would not enjoy the next moments of your life. Uh, but uh, something like that could be pretty sweet and, and tasty. So just to talk about a, the long-term trends in the fishery, uh, the sea urchin fishery in Oregon is really, uh, you know, been characterized as a boom and bust fishery, but that's not the entire story. Uh, it went from non-existent in the early 1980s uh, to a situation where uh, the Japanese economy was booming and there was a lot of demand for uni there that they could not provide. 
uh, so that fishery began to move to the U.S. West Coast and uh, went all the way through California and finally reached Oregon in about 1987 or so. Uh, and at that time, sea urchin divers uh, found just basically virgin stock of these very old sea urchins that have been without any predator for more than 100 years at that time. Uh, and kelp beds were great in those years, those were La Nina years, uh, and market was great. So, so a lot of people had a lot of good times around Port Orford around these years. The fishery just got gigantic. I mean, I know it's only marks on a, on a graph, but this, this uh, year, 1990, the sea urchin fishery was bigger than the Dungeness crab fishery in that year. Uh, it was really a big boom. Those guys going out each day making uh, a few thousand dollars. Uh, but after that, after they had mined down that uh, virgin stock, because you don't have these annual recruitment events, it's kind of turned into this small, stable fishery. You know, these, uh, these blips on the y-axis don't show up very much, but it's mostly just drown out because of this, these big few years. These, this is a pretty valuable fishery. It's our third most valuable shellfish fishery to crab and shrimp. Uh, like I touched on here before, 90% uh, of the fishery occurs in the south coast. But even more important than that, I think, is that uh, almost all the fishery, 71%, occurs at these offshore reefs. So not, not like where people are familiar going down to the beach and seeing a kelp bed, but uh, Port Orford Reef and Rogue Reef are distant uh, from the beach, uh, and, and that's where that's where most of the harvest has occurred. Most of our kelp buds are out there as well. Uh, lastly, to talk about just like a kind of a trends in the fishery is uh, this fishery exhibited this really cool uh, dynamic response pattern where uh, the x-axis here is the amount of trips divers make in a year and the y-axis is the average landing they made. And you can see these three different eras where the fishery, you know, there was a small number of trips and they were catching tons and tons and then they uh, just worked the stock down. So that worked in reverse. And then for the last many years, it's ended up in this sort of stable situation with a, a small number of trips, but a pretty, a pretty valuable uh, fishery. So dynamic, yep, early years, yep, uh, great success and little effort. And then more about, you know, the stock being mined out. I just want to emphasize that, you know, just there's not annual returns on uh, sea urchins. It's, it's uh, at the ocean's whim. And then just how this uh, fishery had settled into a small, valuable fishery suited to that small suit, uh, small fleet. And the future is unclear because this all happened basically on one stock. Uh, and, and basically what has happened, and I'll show you in the next section, is, is the stock has basically just replenished to what it was prior to, to all this. Uh, so how we, how we learn how many sea urchins are out there is by surveying. And how we do that is we send divers down to perform subtitle belt transects. These are about 30 to 40 meters long by two meters wide. You send a pair of divers down there and they count and measure the sea urchins in that transect. Uh, we do that with index sites, meaning we go back to the same places year in, year out. Uh, the frequency of these surveys is uh, not scheduled necessarily. We've done a lot in the 90s and then we've done a lot in the 2010s. We have focused on Port Orford Reef mainly because that is half of the fishery. So all these little dots over here on Orford Reef are sites that we've returned to since, you know, as early as 1984, uh, but did with frequency in the 90s and the 2010s. Uh, so there's a few slides I shoved in here at the last minute just to kind of give you guys like a gee whiz picture level of what's changed at Orford Reef. So 
here we are. This is where I'm going to show you pictures from. This is Port Orford Reef, you know, town of Port Orford's down here. You got to go uh, past Titchener Rock, and uh, there's a, the state's biggest uh, reef is right out there. A real beautiful spot. And this is what it looked like in 2014 when we did surveys. This is Arch Rock, one of the first rocks you come out to as you approach the reef from the south. And you can see in that year, just as just anecdote, really, but uh, you know we had trouble doing the surveys. There was so much kelp. It was a really uh, cool water year the prior year too. We had a, had a great, uh, great ocean. And then in 2016, the same place, the same site, there was very little kelp. That, those issues of getting through the kelp to do the surveys were not issues. And then when we did it in 2019, there was almost no kelp. Uh, so kelp is a annual, I think, but uh, there's still this, been this trend of down with the trend in uh, ocean waters and being warmer through those years. Same thing out at Humbug. We did surveys out there and there was some kelp in 2016 and there was basically none in 2019. Oh, and then we have an intermission. I've, it's given 40 minutes and I practice this and only take 20 minutes. So I, so I uh, thought I'd give you guys a little break in the middle of this. And what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna show you survey video from the same site at Port Arford Reef in 2011 and then show you the same site in 2019. So uh, let me just pause this first and tell you that this video is uh, just a supplement to how we count, you know, just to give other people an idea of what things look down there. So it's not quantitative. Uh, so it's kind of shaky, seasick, we'll see. So this is the this is the line that we do a survey on. Um, you know, somebody in front of the person videoing has rolled that out, and what you see on the bottom is a lot of red algae. Uh, I, Sarah could do this part a lot better than me, but a lot of green stuff floating around down there, right? A lot of drift kelp, not really overrun with urchins so much some sea cucumbers over there, some drift kelp. There's a male kelp greenling for what it's worth. Kind of following the diver. And there's some sea urchins kind of stuffed in a crack there in a urticaina anemone. Some more sea urchins stuffed in cracks as they are. And that I think is a laminaria or something. Again, Sarah would be more useful than me here. Some hydroids and a dermisterius. I don't think on this video, we were seeing a lot of Pycnopodia, of course, on every transect in the past, but I don't think this one actually has any of those large-bodied sea stars. And that's the end of that transect. So we'll look at the same place last year. He's at 55 feet for what it's worth. So this is the same site last year, and we have, uh, I'm getting oriented there, you know, a lot less drift kelp, uh, certainly around, it's, it's more exposed rocks that have been scrubbed down a bit, and you can see when he focuses on the bottom, you can see a uh, Purple sea urchins are generally the small ones you see, and generally the larger ones you see are going to be red sea urchins. You're down at 60 feet, so the, the color's not great. Uh, 
but you can see the absence of, of drift. That's a bunch of purples there. That's the other diver. And just, there's a red there, that big guy, and then some purples. You see some urchins roaming around, you know, as opposed to the other video where they're stuffed into a crack, you know, without, without the small uh, sea urchin predator of, of sea stars and with the need to move about and find food, uh, those sea urchins are out of cracks and walking around. Those are all sea urchins. Steady. And that's the end of that, that one. So that was your intermission. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I mean, I guess I wanted to fill some time there too, but just give everybody a general idea of what, what that all looks like, uh, the time difference. So the result of those surveys uh, shows that this gray, on this bar chart is, is uh, red sea urchins. And you see, there was a lot of red sea urchins prior to the fishery beginning. And then they were uh, sequentially kind of mined down. And by 2011, we really barely had a, a commercial amount of sea urchins available to sea urchin fishermen. It was pretty slim pickings, you know, uh, for sea urchins. and. Uh, then around 2016, we started to see uh, the consequences of these big uh, recruitment events that probably occurred 2014 to 2016. And so if you just look at the gray bars, you see you know, the fish down sort of, and then kind of the full rebound to where there was more sea urchins in 2019 than there had been in 1984. Now, it, it comes with the big caveat that these 1984 sea urchins were probably uh, much, much larger than the 2019. So it's not really a biomass estimate, just an individual density estimate. But it shows that that stock is fully recovered, really without any recruitment. Uh, if we move over to this graph on the right, these are histograms of of sizes of sea urchins, so small sea urchins on the left, big sea urchins on the right. And you see the first year we measured them was 1991, and, and you have a lot of big sea urchins over here, but you also have this dominant cohort uh, here at about 85 or something like that. And that cohort of sea urchins was probably born, you know, that was a big event probably five years prior to this, maybe 1986 or something. And you can see that that, if you follow just the peak, you can see that is that same cohort, cohort sequentially getting larger over time. I told you these, these guys live very long lives. Uh, so this is almost certainly the same population, the same cohort, same age class of, of sea urchins just getting slowly larger. So they were 75 millimeters you know, three inches or something in 1991. And by 2014, they're five inches. So that's, they, they grow fast to start out with, then it really levels out. Now, everything really changed, as I was saying, in 2016, when we had these big recruitment events. So where the population had been dominated by large sea urchins just a few years before, uh, the current population is is really just very uh, heavily dominated by small sea urchins. And those are all reds. Uh, so just for a second, I'm gonna talk about purples. Uh, the nature of these surveys was always to survey red sea urchins, which was the, the fishery target. And uh, consequently, 
they're all set in deeper water where you don't really expect to see a lot of, or you didn't expect to see a lot of purple sea urchins. And sure enough, uh, they saw very few, the white bar here at purple sea urchins, and they really were just a blip on those surveys in any years until 2016 and 2019 when they became a major component of uh, what, what was being counted down there. So basically went from nothing to the most uh, common animal down there. Uh, so yeah, these bullets are just saying those, those sea urchins, how the fishery mined out that single uh, cohort probably and uh, then fully recovered. And then uh, regarding purples, just to, re to review there, went from barely there to dominating. Uh, so here's some of the things we've learned from doing uh, this work following this fishery is, is those fishery independent index surveys are really critical for us to understand what's happening uh, to those stocks over time. You can't really get a snapshot since they live such long lives and exist on a different temporal scale than we do, uh, repeating the same places over and over and having an organized backlog of data is really critical to understanding the trends in that stock. And then further, that fishery and stock do not re rely on annual cycles like crab or, or shrimp or salmon, um, things you're more familiar with. Uh, it's instead, uh, almost random uh, based on ocean conditions. And then this is maybe more about uh, fishery management, uh, but this bullet says that j about just restraining the fishery and harvest areas, like making a quota is way, way less valuable for a species like this than just preserving some source areas that can act kind of as a spawning stock for the fished areas. And then there's some what's next. Uh, this is a, you know, a purple sea urchin barren, I suppose you would call it. Uh, they're, they're voracious. The, the purples do have a different behavior than reds, where reds, like this is a red, and these are purples. Reds tend to be more drift eaters versus purples will be more aggressive. Uh, purples, primary predator, has always been this uh, species of sea star called Pycnopodia or sunflower star. And those all melted in 2014. So uh, the game has really changed for purple sea urchins. It seems likely that the Pycnopodia limited them from access to deeper areas where you'd want to be a larger sea urchin to avoid being eaten by, by these predators. So purples have really changed, gone way up, and having Pycnopodia all dead is, is really, really sad and changes uh, changes the game for purples. It really allows them into new habitats uh, to, and allows them to be emergent rather than hiding from Pycnopodia, which would really, they really mowed them down. And uh, the fisheries are unlikely to control these purple sea urchin populations. They, they've never been a major part of fisheries. Uh, markets have never wanted them very much. There could be some, you know, small markets here and there, but that's not been the history. There might be a way you could turn lemons into lemonade here or something, but the history has not been that fisheries or fishery markets are interested in purple sea urchins. So I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, in regards to red sea urchins, those have increased in some areas, particularly around Orford Reef, uh, not necessarily in others. And th those episodes of recruitment is the first one that we've seen for red sea urchins since 1986, really. So that's interesting. And then uh, that, that single recruitment event would likely be able to fuel that fishery for many years. The, you know, soon after I, I started this job uh, in 2004 and soon before that, a lot of places were experimenting with planting sea urchins, you know, because there was such a deficit compared to, you know, they had a fishery built up and then there was no sea urchins. So uh, this, this recruitment event sort of is a, is a natural replenishment to, to those stocks. 
you know, who knows how they'll use that or, or what will become of those. But just to say, that is kind of how they refill the fishery. So just to summarize those, you know, sea urchins are an important component. It's, you know, they can definitely rise to pest level and stuff like that, but uh, they do serve a critical role in our near shore. Uh, their long lines and episodic recruitment really, really swings across a temporal range. Their abundances probably always are going way up and way down just because they don't recruit reliably uh, or consistently. And that fishery is valuable and really focuses on uh, large red sea urchins. And then just to talk more about that, how that fishery had operated, it was just mined out a stock of sea urchins, but it took 30 years. And then uh, just the thing, ways things have changed, you know, everything that we've known in the past is kind of in the history books now because we have a new a new normal out there, a new environment, uh, and uh, it's hard to say what will happen. And then I just have some, I guess, last words to impart. Uh, the sea urchins definitely depress kelp abundances, but uh, they may not be the primary driver of kelp recruitment in Oregon. When we saw, uh, you know, our best kelp years were right around when we had the highest abundances of red sea urchins in the early 90s. Uh, but obviously, sea urchins are eating kelp and, and obviously affect it, but it's unclear, you know, it may not be a case that you kill all the sea urchins and you have tons of kelp. That, that may not be. It seems like there's another driver at work, but uh, hopefully we'll hear more from Sarah. And I have low amount of expertise there. Just wanted to contribute that. And the Pycnopodia and other large bodied sea stars that all melted in 2014 are really missed. Uh, just like just like the sea otter, you know, from our, it's a big piece uh, of our near shore ecology that's no longer there. Uh, so the future's unclear for those guys too, you know, if they happen to be able to succeed recruit, recruiting back, that could have a big effect on those small sea urchins they eat. Uh, and I think this is the last one. Uh, we have a tool to deal with a lot of red sea urchins. You know, fishery, it's a wanted fishery product. That, that doesn't exist for purple sea urchins. And then the last one is uh, just about abalones. Abalones, there's seven species along the West Coast and five are currently on ESA lists. Uh, the other two, which are reds and flats, you know, are probably not too far away. And, and this situation is, is very likely to affect their populations further. The, their main competitor is sea urchins and their main food is kelp. So uh, you can imagine that competition. And I think that's all, all I have here if there's any questions. Thanks, Scott. Uh, this is John Goodell and I'll, I'll just relay some of the questions to you and uh, I will do that in the order we received them and we won't be able to get to all of them. So for those folks that submitted questions, I apologize uh, that we won't be able to get to everyone. But uh, the first question is from Melanie and from Danielle. And when you say, when you mentioned at the beginning, certified sustainable, who is the certification agency and what are some of the benchmarks or protocols that would, you know, allow the, the entity to designate a, a sustainable fishery? Uh, so for pink shrimp, uh, that's the one that's certified sustainable and the certifying uh, group is Marine Stewardship Council, which is the the top, you know, the, the sort of the, the top of the worldwide sustainability certifications. And that sustainability certification is built on, uh, one is to assure that the stock isn't being overfished, which we do quantitatively in a, in a way that's too dry to explain here. But uh, two is to limit the fisheries effect to other species. So in that one, uh, we've done a lot of work and worked with industry to virtually eliminate a lot of bycatch issues. And then three is to assure the fishery doesn't affect habitats. 
uh, in a way that's like unrecoverable or there's enough reserve other places. And for that, in that fishery, we, we do uh, periodic checks of uh, unfished versus a fished area and look at recovery rates. Yeah, thank you. The my next question is from uh, Eric Eric Foster, and it he asked, um, is the low number of urchin permit holders, harvesters in Oregon, um, basically, could you elaborate on, on why it's so low? Is it has to do with the, just, it can't sustain more participants, or are there other reasons why there's so few uh, urchin harvesting, you know, har harvest operation, operations in Oregon? That, that uh, I've, Mainly that, that that fishery is artisanal, it's very hard work, uh, very scary and dangerous at times, and they haven't, you know, nobody's recruited into that. We, we allow up to 12 permits and only half of them are being used. So there's, there's room for, you know, you would have to buy a permit just like you would for crab or something else, but we have permits available that aren't being used and nobody buying them and using them, so. Gotcha. There's a jumping back to pink shrimp uh, question from James. What is the depth range of the pink shrimp fishery? Uh, they're 80 to 80 to 150 fathoms. So that's that's a you know 160 to 300 meters. Gotcha. All and mud bottom. Great, thanks. The one question from Josie is: Can you characterize the Oregon recreational abalone fishery? I I, I think. Maybe the, the, the ab, there wasn't. Maybe it, well, maybe there isn't any abalone recreational abalone fishery in Oregon. But can you characterize Oregon recreational abalone fishery compared to California's? Why is it possible to discuss things like sea otter reintroduction in Oregon relative to abalone, whereas in California's North Coast it is a, is a uh, controversial um, because of the abalone fishery? Uh, well. To characterize Oregon's red abalone fishery in the last 20 years, basically, it's been a trophy fishery. Uh, a lot of animals grow to their largest size at their polar extents, and the red abalone is the largest abalone in the world, and Oregon is its polar extent. So Oregon actually has the largest abalones in the world. Uh, so, so the fishery has actually been one of those rare cases where it's a trophy fishery. You know, you think about trophy hunting as, you know, this one thing, and I never think about trophy invertebrates, but uh, Oregon's abalone were that. Uh, we had people come from other parts of the world and a lot from California just to see who could get the biggest shell. And sure enough, the biggest shells came out of Oregon. And then regarding how that, the, the nexus with sea otters, I mean, that's definitely the, the first thing sea otters are gonna eat is abalones, uh, you know, the, 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 they prefer abalones and, and sea urchins as, as the little I understand compared to the rest of the group here. So that would be a concern if that was a primary uh, fishery. In Oregon, it might be that those abalones are so tucked away it might be less of a concern, but uh, we just don't have, we don't have the size of fishery as they do there too. Okay, I got another question from Gail, and, and she mentioned in your two videos appear to show a tremendous change in red algae cover um, between the two dates. Uh, said red, she said red algae are known to be important habitat for kelp gametophytes. Would not their demise affect the regrowth of kelp in this area? If that's Gail Hansen, I think that would be a question that Gail Hansen should answer more than me. I don't know. You know, it was just two videos we took of virgins. Yeah. I, I just know there's a lot more kelp in 2011 than there was in 2019. That's the rest is out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, okay, I'll see if we have time for one more question. Um, Sounds to me like we now have robust red abalone population near Port Orford. Have, have ODFW adjusted fishery management to shift away from the old model? And if that, if, sorry, I'm not gonna get that, to that one quite yet. Um, here's one from Lillian. What are the human demographics of the red urchin fishery? Are the fishermen women mostly close to retirement or are they, are there young participants as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a, 
important question because in California, the way the sea urchin fishery has been limited in permits, it's been attrition. So each year you can't get a new permit. So each year, every permittee gets one year older, right? And eventually you lose permittees. Uh, in Oregon, uh, we do have some younger participants, but like I said, it's a artisanal fishery that's a lifelong fishery. So there's uh, several guys that have many years ahead of them. You know, we have some people that have just started in the fishery. Uh, it's a little different permit system that causes that, but uh, the ages of the small number of people we have is really across the board. Okay, I got one, maybe one more question from uh, our final question from Bruce. Are there any plans for offshore wind farms or tidal energy sites that would imperil any of these invertebrate fisheries? There's nothing I know about that would imperil the, you know, sea urchins colonies. They're so close to the beach, but I'm, I'm a little out of that. That'd be a, I could refer someone to that question, but that's a little out of mine. No problem. Well, thanks so much again for giving your presentation. And I, I learned a lot. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I want to pass it over to Bob. Thanks. Thank you, John. I don't know if I'm popped back up on the screen yet or not. You are. I am. And I would answer that last question by saying, Bruce, if you're interested, uh, I can talk more with you offline or anybody that's interested. We can have a dialogue. I was very involved in, in the planning for some of that offshore ocean wave energy a few years ago. And there's a lot of background and detail to it. But uh, at present, there's no plans for that, at least in state waters um, at, at the present time. So thank you everybody for attending this first session. We'll take a five minute break and allow new people to come in if they're attending and then we will get to our next speaker. So let's all uh, take a break here. <laughs>